In moments of crisis, healthcare doors open when most other doors close. I've been giving a lot of thought to this lately, to the why and the who, and the consistent thread seems to me to be the presence of nurses. The Gallup organization conducts an annual poll to measure public perception of the honesty and ethics of various professions. They started doing this back in 1976, and they added nurses to the list in 1999. In 2001, in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, firefighters topped the list. In 2020, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, nurses topped the list. And I don't think it's surprising to see that kind of spike in reputational perception when there's been a kind of cataclysmic event. But what is remarkable is that with the exception of 2001, nurses have also topped this list every single year since 1999. What is it about nurses? For ACHC, many of our programs support recognition in organizations for which the nursing function is mission critical. Home health, hospice, home infusion therapy, and of course hospitals are just a few examples of organizations that cannot operate without their nursing staff. So for this episode of the podcast, I've asked nurses to share how they think about what they do. Beyond the Standard is a production of Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, providers of accreditation services for a wide range of community-based healthcare providers, including home health, pharmacy, demi-pose, home infusion therapy, behavioral health, palliative care, hospice, and renal dialysis, as well as hospitals, laboratories, and ambulatory surgery centers. Cindy Newman is a senior clinical review specialist for our Ambulatory Surgery Center accreditation program. She shared her story with me saying, like many others I've spoken with, that a career in nursing became clear to her at an early age. She told me her father had had a heart attack at age 52 when she was 13 years old. Her mom felt overwhelmed by the machines and equipment he was hooked up to, but Cindy would gladly spend every free moment at his bedside and she says she knew then that she would become a nurse and take care of people like her dad. And she did, finishing nursing school and going to work in a cardiology unit. But this is where Cindy's story takes a unique turn. She was 30 with two young children working in cardiology and also in oncology when her community put out a call for people to test for admission to the police academy to address a shortage of officers. 100 people accepted that challenge and one of them was Cindy. At 30, she was the oldest of the three women who were accepted into the academy class. Having completed that training, she shifted to work full-time as a police officer, and she says she loved it, but the call to nursing remained strong. And ultimately, she switched back to nursing full-time while maintaining her work as a volunteer police officer for years with that same department. This is not a woman who shrinks from hard work. She said she had the best of both worlds. In both careers, she was in a position to help people when they were at their most vulnerable. So I'm joined now by Kayla Pfeiffer, who is um, a, a friend that I met at ACHCU Academy back in December. And actually we had this conversation, you'll remember Kayla, at that time. Um, and you know that wonderful Muzak that they um, pipe into hotels and after you've been there for a while, you stop hearing it. <laughs> well, if you try to record a podcast, the people listening never stop hearing it. And when we got back, um, you know, and we were getting ready to release this, it, there was just no way we could um, share this with the world, with the audio the way it was. And so Kayla has really, really generously agreed to have a similar conversation with me again. Will you please introduce yourself, where you work, um, and then tell us how you became a nurse? Sure. Um, my name is Kayla Piper. I work at Fisher Titus Medical Center, which is in Norwalk, Ohio. Um, I've been a nurse since 2010. And I kind of always knew that I wanted to help others. Um, I absolutely love to learn. Um, I like to help people not feel nervous or if they injure themselves. I was kind of always that kid that said, hey, come here, I'll help you. Um, I will say I'm a very biased pediatric nurse. I'm also an educator. Um, I'm a mom. And I feel like for me, I was probably just destined to be 
in healthcare. When I first became a nurse, I was working on a pediatric floor and working with post-ops. And I started be becoming a very biased peds nurse. And I started realizing that I love to teach other people. So I started um, being a preceptor a lot. And so then I fell in love with education as well. And I figured the best way to help kids is if I taught all nurses how to take care of kids so the same way that I would. So then I fell in love with that. Um, because then you can help more than just the patients that you have that are assigned to you that day. I became the education manager um, at the hospital that I am in right now after I got my master's in nursing, which was really um, a great opportunity to learn from a lot of nursing leaders around the world. Um, and then I flipped into patient safety and accreditation in 2019. And I love it. Um, I feel like it's the other side of education. I feel like it's all come full circle for me from being at the bedside to educating others to doing patient safety and seeing the safety events inside the system and helping others understand standards. Um, because a lot of times when you say, you know, we need to talk about the standards of the chapter or why is this policy 12 pages or whatever, um, I feel like I can help them with the why. Um, and I think that's a really cool thing about nurses is we're very good at explaining the why of what's going on, their care plan, how can we help them, and, you know, just listen to them talk. As a communicator, um, I'm always really aware of um, how things are being said, and I think that pediatrics has a lot to offer um, all of healthcare because you are you have to be a translator constantly in, in that kind of role because you are helping the caregivers for your patients understand. You're helping the patients themselves, you know, based on their age, understand in an appropriate way that they are going to be able to manage um, emotionally and intellectually based on their stage of development. Um, and then you are also communicating with your peers in order to facilitate that continuity of care. And so, your skills as a communicator, um, having led you into the role that you're in now, makes perfect sense to me. Sounds to me like the yes. nursing is is it for yeah. you. Yeah, I I really think that. I think that once you find your core, and even though I'm not taking care of them like on a daily basis, like if you always go back to the core of why you're doing what you do in all of your roles, then I think that's really a pretty profound thing. And in nursing. You can kind of do anything that you want. One of the things that I, I find really fun about nursing is I still am not quite sure what it is that I want to be when I grow up. And I've been doing this for over a decade. But I think it's because there's so many opportunities. Like right now, I learn from the state. I also learn from our organization and the community. But you're never going to stop learning. And that's a huge benefit to any job in healthcare, but especially in nursing. Mm -hmm. It is. Now, it, you're really dedicated. Everybody else that I am going to be talking to is is really committed to nursing in an ongoing way. And yet there's so much in the news these days about nursing shortages and people leaving the profession. Um, I wonder, one, are you seeing that in your organization? Um, you know, to what extent how is it impacting the organization? You know, how are you, how are you managing it? You know, just talk to me about that. Yeah. Um, well, I think that we have to start with probably the pandemic. I mean, that was a really hard thing for a lot of nurses. And it was a point in time, I think, for a lot of people where you either had to shut the book on nursing and healthcare in general once you got to that point, or you had to figure out how to turn the page and just move on to the next chapter. And I think that um, the pandemic was hard for nurses, both personally and professionally. And I think that in nursing, a lot of us focus very much on, you know, I'm here for my patients, I, I got to get this done, we're doing this, you know, we'll stay over, we'll do all these different things. But then it started impacting, well, well, you're also at risk for getting this disease. And not only are you at risk of getting it, you could take it home. And I think that hit everybody really hard. Um, so I think that that was a difficult thing. And for the people who wanted to close the book, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it did kind of leave a lot of organizations shorthanded and 
not only that, but people were getting sick. So we had to get very creative. And I will say that I'm pretty lucky to work at an organization that we're very innovative in how we do what we do. We allow our um, all of our teams to work together to come up with different ideas. And we focused on team nursing. We did a lot of cross training and competencies. We had a really, I was really proud of our incident command team. Every day we would get together and we would go through like your Hicks chart for an incident command team. And that's something that um, we did for, I can't even remember how many, we were in the hundreds of doing it on a daily basis and really just going through what was going on on the floors, how, how was census, how was our supplies, how was the community, the staff, everyone. But in that moment, that's where we were able to connect with each other and really focus on, okay, well, I know that we need to do, we need these staff to move over here. Well, someone else on this side of the room would say, hey, you know, well, we should make sure that they have the right competency and that they understand the new equipment because maybe they've not used that. So it was just a lot of collaboration, um, which was amazing. And then we could take all the stuff in incident command and then go to those different locations. I feel like for our organization, that was a huge thing on top of um, team nursing and leaders jumping in. I will say that a lot of the nursing leaders here, um, we all stay up to date on our skills and we can go out and help. And I think focusing on that servant leadership is really important that you can be over here building a policy, but then jump in if there's a code or something like that. One of the things that you said when we talked back in December that really stuck with me, you were talking about this idea of, of team nursing. Um, and I do find that to be one of the um, primary characteristics of the nurses that I've talked to is that they they really understand the concept of of teams. And you said that the exper experienced nurses bring critical thinking yeah. and the newer nurses bring fresh ideas and that that together is a win win for the, both the patients and the teams that are supporting them. It came from being the education manager because I would have all these brand new nurses and they would come in and they would challenge, you know, you know like the evidence-based practice or the research or they were very driven towards that. And we had our experienced nurses who had that great critical thinking. And when you put it together, it's just pretty phenomenal, but it was to an extreme height during the pandemic. And I would say that that was, it was perfect um, to be able to have both sides of that, to be able to help the patients. That's great, that's great. So what would you say to somebody who was thinking about nursing as a career today? Yeah, so I would probably say that you have to know that you wanna help others. And you have to be able to. Well, doesn't everybody? I mean, yeah. let's be honest. Wouldn't everybody say that? So, I think what is it? You know, I'm I really trying different. to understand. When you say that you want to help someone, you're going to have to help someone in a way that they're never going to remember you. You're going to help them in the most vulnerable time of their life or the most amazing time. I mean, we see both extremes. Um, and I really think that you just have to know that when you say you want to help someone that you're fully committing to helping both their mind their body and their soul holistic nursing i think if you feel passionate towards that you have a lot of empathy and you also just have that desire to learn and push the envelope on at least for me like evidence-based practice well why is this if you have a huge desire to understand the why and help um, i think that that is a big deal for nurses My name is Barb Sylvester. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Quality here at ACHC. And my role includes overseeing the quality department. So that's everything from customer satisfaction to complaints against accredited organizations to overseeing our risk management framework, our, our ISO certification. And on the regulatory side, overseeing our deeming authority with CMS, um, understanding the federal and state implications that we have as an accrediting organization. Just a little job, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you're also a nurse. I am. 
Um, and we have lots of nurses working at ACHC. Um, and But tell me your own story. How did you become a nurse? So I think it all starts back with, with my mom. Uh, she's been absolutely one of the most inspiring women I've ever met. Um, and when I was little, she worked in an NICU or neonatal ICU. Um, I marveled over her technical skill, and she was just never ending with her compassion. And I, I can remember being a child and bragging in the neighborhood and telling kids how every year we would get all these Christmas cards, and they would show pictures of little babies that would grow into toddlers and children, and it'd be appreciation notes from their parents saying, thank you for all you did for my baby, and look at her now, look at how she's growing. Um, and so I grew up thinking what a marvelous difference my mom made in the world. And then as I got older, my mom went back to school for an advanced degree. And by that point in her career, she was promoted and she became the head nurse or the largest nursery in all of Wisconsin. And then I get to I got to watch her um, as a leader and to see her astute business side. So growing up, it was always being able to look toward a mentor like my mom. And so when it came time for me to decide what to do, you know, people say, why did you become a nurse? And I think the right answer is always to say, because I wanted to take care of people. But for me, really, I wanted to become a nurse because I wanted the flexibility of having a professional, um, a professional job, something that, that I could be respected for, and at the same time have a family. Because growing up, that was my main goal. I wanted to be a mom. And nursing gave me that flexibility. Hmm. But it wasn't long after when I became a nurse that I realized nursing fulfilled my internal needs. It, 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 it looked at my strengths, my ability to be analytical and technical and compassionate, but also gave me that flexibility then to be a mom. Um, and so as I think about it, actually... Probably one of the greatest reasons was I was able to be like my mom uh, in my nursing career. And so that gave me a lot of pride and a lot of happiness over the years. When I um, was a floor nurse, I took care of patients after surgery. So it was post-op and I loved it. I loved bedside nursing and I did it part-time PMs, right? Because I wanted to raise my family. And I loved it. And I thought, I will never leave bedside nursing. I want to be there to make a difference for these patients. And then I had a back injury and it mm -hmm. pulled me away from that patient care and took me into home health because then I, by that time I was ready to go to daytime, full-time work because my kids were in school, but I needed something less physically stressful as working in the hospital. So when I went into home health, I began loving working in a patient's home and being able to show them how to adapt with whatever condition they have to their home. Um, and shortly after, within a year, I was um, asked to take on a management role. And I first thought, ooh, I'll never like being away from my patients. But what I realized is I could now do educating to nurses. I could teach them things that I had learned in order to give the best quality care to patients. And so my next role in management led me to the need to go on for education. So then I needed to get a degree in business so that I not only knew the nursing aspect, but that for my organization, I could be the best manager. Um, one promotion after another was afforded to me. And so by that time, I thought, well, now I better go back for another degree and this time get my master's. And I wanted to have it in quality because I was so focused on patient care that provides quality. And I also wanted that degree to, to be in leadership. Uh, so my master's is in quality and leadership. And by the point when I um, finished that education, I began to think of what else can I do in quality besides influencing just the organization that I'm working at? How can I in influence a larger population? And at that point, I had the opportunity to um, interview at ACHC and realize that taking that love, that commitment, that passion, and putting it toward uh, national standards was really a great use of my time and my ability. Barb, um, we've seen the public health emergency, the COVID-19 public health emergency um, ha has obviously had a huge impact on healthcare as a whole and on nurses very specifically. And subsequent to that, um, we're hearing from our organizations that there are a lot of staffing stresses because there are people who have made the decision to leave the profession 
Kayla again talked a little bit about that and how her organization has coped. What would you say to somebody who was looking at going into nursing now? I think that anybody that wants to go into nursing, if they have the skills to do so, then it's the right job for them. Every career has times when you doubt, did I make the right decision? Are the challenges too difficult for me as an individual? But if it's the right career, you find that it's exactly what you should be doing and that you're able to impact the lives of others. Mostly I find that people who want to be nurses are people who have that strong ability to communicate, who have an uh, empathetic nature and who have the analytical and technical skills to be there. You might find when you first become a nurse that you have to look really hard to find out where exactly should I be doing that nursing? Is it going to be in an ICU or with babies? Is it going to be with pediatrics? Is it going to be in long-term care or in community-based care? And it may take you a few years to figure out where do I really want to be? But for those people who were born to be nurses, then just finding that exact location will confirm to them that this really does um, affirm their belonging to be a nurse. Um, I know that during the PHE that many people were stressed beyond the limit. And for them to leave the profession was the right thing to do. Uh, the challenges that they overcame, we will never understand. Um, it, it doesn't mean that they took the wrong career path. It meant that they did their job they accomplished what they needed to do, and it was time to do something else. And some of those nurses might find that five or 10 years later, they come back to the profession. Um, so I would encourage, highly encourage anyone who wants to become a nurse. Um, you know, and in today's world, there's so many venues for nurses, and it might be patient care, it might be education or academia, it could be accreditation. There's so many different places for nurses to be able to practice that I would highly encourage anyone to go into the field. Now I'm joined by Terry Speaks. And Terry, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, if you would. Yeah, good morning. My name's uh, at Terry Speaks, and I work for a national hospice provider and have worked in the hospice field since 1992. And you're a nurse? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I am. Um, and how did you get into nursing? Why did you choose nursing? Uh, nursing chose me, I believe. Um, I've got a, a book, one of those grow with me books that some parents keep for their children year after year. And I went back and looked at that. And that book began when I was five. And every year, with the exception of one that I thought I wanted to be a horseback rider, um, I put nurse, um, even at ages where I don't really think I should have known what nursing was. So really, I feel like Inherently, nursing chose me, but I think it works for me because I, I'm somebody who I want to help. I believe we should help others. I like taking care of other people, and I and I, be, I like to advocate for people. I think there's a lot of folks in the world who aren't able to advocate for themselves for you know various reasons, um, and I think that's a platform that nursing can really step up and shine as being that advocate. Straight out of school, I went to work with geriatric patients. I had a, a real love for ge the geriatric population. And very quickly, I realized that I wasn't able to do what I really felt like I needed to do. There were so many medications to give, treatments to do. That's how most of my day was spent. And I watched the hospice nurses come in and they would get to sit down and talk to the patients and and deal with the person, not the patient. And that's mm -hmm. what I wanted. That's what my heart was being called to. So within a year, um, I made the transition over to hospice and started out in home care. And I've held many positions in the in the field since, but um, really once I got there, within my my first little orientation period, I realized that I was where I was meant to be. That's one of the beauties of hospice is not only can you see the the patient as the person, you also get to interact, support, educate the family, um, or in you know people caring for them, important people in their lives. You really 
you get to extend your reach as a nurse. You may not physically be able to care for those people, but emotionally, psychosocially, you're able to do that. Um, and you learn so much more about the person, the, the primary person you're caring for, um, you know, watching these interactions and um, stories that their caregivers may tell. Um, it, it's really like you walk in hand in hand with that family or that support system the individual has. And, and in some times there's not a support system. Um, mm -hmm. And then you just, you take that, that individual's Become hand that. and you walk together. So if, if for nurses that are, um, you know, in a hospital setting or an ambulatory surgery setting or in most settings, their goal is to say goodbye to their patient and know that their patient is, is you know, has been discharged and is, um, you know, going back to hopefully achieve a level of quality of life that is as good or better than how they arrived. Mm -hmm. um, you have a little bit different situation with hospice. You know that that you know saying goodbye to your patients is is saying goodbye to them. They are they are going to die. How do you protect your your own emotional response to that? Um, that is probably the I think the most difficult thing for nursing nurses who are in the the hospice environment. Um, you you have to first of all have very good boundary setting um and and adhere to those boundaries it's real easy to want to cross over and from being the professional helping this individual and family through an end of life process to being their their friend um you can mm -hmm. care about them you can do all sorts of things but you do have to have that good boundary um you, you have to lean on your own support systems, you know, what, whatever they may be, your family, your faith, your friends, whatever. And I think ultimately you just have to accept that there are days that you have to go home and you just sit down and cry. And you, mm -hmm. you, you cry for the beautiful things you've seen. You cry for the sad things you've seen and just kind of give yourself a little bit of grace. And then you, you know, tuck in those tears, wipe your nose and get back out and start all over again. So I'm guessing that the boundary setting that you're talking about is, is invis ideally it's invisible to your patient and their family. I mean, they probably perceive you as, as a friend, as, you know, something more than just a, the professional that you are in that setting. Um, do you ever find that they have a hard time letting go of you? Yeah, yeah. And and that's one of the areas that I do wish there was a little bit more of a transition for hospice nursing. You know, when a, when a patient dies, the the survivors receive bereavement care from a bereavement coordinator, you know, for up to 13 months after the death. And in most hospice settings, the nurse has an opportunity to make a final call or a final visit, but then you do you break away and you you keep moving along. And I think for some families that is difficult because they feel like you've just kind of forgotten about them when in reality you don't. I mean, to this day, I can go back and pick out memories of patients from my very first year of hospice nursing that for one reason or another stood out for me, whether it was the way they died or the lessons they taught me. I don't think when you introduced yourself, um, you sit, told me what your current role is. Mm -hmm. Are you still doing bedside nursing? Or are you in an administrative role? No, I'm in an administrative role now. Yep. And um, quite honestly, because my heart couldn't take the bedside anymore. <laughs> um, you know, after a period of time, um, for me personally, I was having more and more difficulty letting go of of the of the f people's pain, um, th their grief, um, and it just was becoming a little bit more difficult for me. So from that boundary perspective, I found it better um, for me to move into more of a compliance education role. And now my goal is to make sure that the newer nurses who come into our organization understand how to care for these folks, that they're you know documenting doing that correctly. Um, but also understand that hospice nursing is not just, you know, a, a job where you breeze in and out, that that we have to sit back and respect 
what we are being handed. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, this is basically you die one time. We can celebrate birthdays over and over. People can have multiple children, multiple marriages. But in this lifetime, we get one death. And if it's not handled appropriately, it can be catastrophic for the individual dying. It can have catastrophic ramifications for the survivors in in regards to guilt and other emotions after the time of death. So it's real important that newer people coming into the profession understand it's not just a dollar amount, you know, that, Mm -hmm. that we're dealing with something very, very special. And the lessons that these individuals and families provide hospice nursing. I would say most of us have are in this for that selfish reason. Um, You learn so much from people at the end of life. So many of them become much more open and may not even realize they're teaching you a lesson, but they are yourself, about your environment, about your community, how to interact with somebody differently next time. Um, The the beauty of love sometimes you just you just see so much and there's so many gifts and I use gifts loosely (laughs) not Mm -hmm. um, tangible things that you can hold in your hand that we do receive from these individuals and families that in my mind I can't imagine why anybody would want to do anything besides hospice (laughs) Um, I I can't imagine that there's an area that's more rewarding than than what we get to see and experience Thank you so much. You are incredibly articulate and, um, and, and I've really enjoyed talking to you. Beyond the Standard is a production of Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, providers of accreditation services for a wide range of community-based healthcare providers, including home health, pharmacy, demi-pose, home infusion therapy, behavioral health, palliative care, hospice, and renal dialysis, as well as hospitals, laboratories, and ambulatory surgery centers. Each episode of Beyond the Standard takes a look at an impactful idea for healthcare provider organizations. We're especially interested in those that help organizations improve as they seek to meet the needs of their communities and the patients that depend on them. ACHC is by providers for providers. Before you go, share your feedback by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and check out our schedule so you don't miss upcoming episodes. For more information about ACHC accreditation, visit achc.org. While you're there, you can subscribe to this podcast and sign up for our newsletters.